Gates of Imagination presents Story of the Young Man in Holy Orders by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Arthur Lane The Reverend Mr. Simon Rolls had distinguished himself in the moral sciences and was more than usually proficient in the study of divinity. His essay on the Christian doctrine of the social obligations obtained for him, at the moment of its production, a certain celebrity in the University of Oxford, and it was understood in clerical and learned circles that young Mr. Rolls had in contemplation a considerable work, a folio, it was said, on the authority of the fathers of the church. These attainments, these ambitious designs, however, were far from helping him to any preferment, and he was still in quest of his first curacy when a chance ramble in that part of London, the peaceful and rich aspect of the garden, a desire for solitude and study, and the cheapness of the lodging, led him to take up his abode with Mr. Rayburn, the nurseryman of Stockdove Lane. It was his habit every afternoon, after he had worked seven or eight hours on St. Ambrose or St. Chrysostom, to walk for a while in meditation among the roses. And this was usually one of the most productive moments of his day. But even a sincere appetite for thought, and the excitement of grave problems awaiting solution, are not always sufficient to preserve the mind of the philosopher against the petty shocks and contacts of the world. And when Mr. Rolls found General Vandeleur's secretary, ragged and bleeding, in the company of his landlord, when he saw both change colour and seek to avoid his questions, and above all, when the former denied his own identity with the most unmoved assurance, he speedily forgot the saints and fathers in the vulgar interest of curiosity. I cannot be mistaken, thought he. That is Mr. Hartley beyond a doubt. How comes he in such a pickle? Why does he deny his name? And what can be his business with that black-looking ruffian, my landlord? As he was thus reflecting, another peculiar circumstance attracted his attention. The face of Mr. Rayburn appeared at a low window next the door, and as chance directed, his eyes met those of Mr. Rolls. The nurseryman seemed disconcerted and even alarmed, and immediately after the blind of the apartment was pulled sharply down. This may all be very well, reflected Mr. Rolls. It may be all excellently well, but I confess freely that I do not think so. Suspicious, underhand, untruthful, fearful of observation, I believe upon my soul, he thought. The pair are plotting some disgraceful action. The detective that there is in all of us awoke and became clamant in the bosom of Mr. Rolls. And with a brisk, eager step that bore no resemblance to his usual gait, he proceeded to make the circuit of the garden. When he came to the scene of Harry's escalade, his eye was at once arrested by a broken rosebush and marks of trampling on the mould. He looked up and saw scratches on the brick and a rag of trouser floating from a broken bottle. This then was the mode of entrance chosen by Mr. Rayburn's particular friend. It was thus that General Vandeleur's secretary came to admire a flower garden. The young clergyman whistled softly to himself as he stooped to examine the ground. He could make out where Harry had landed from his perilous leap. He recognised the flat foot of Mr. Rayburn, where it had sunk deeply in the soil as he pulled up the secretary by the collar. Nay, on a closer inspection, he seemed to distinguish the marks of groping fingers, as though something had been spilt abroad and eagerly collected. Upon my word, he thought, the thing grows vastly interesting. And just then he caught sight of something almost entirely buried in the earth. In an instant, he had disinterred a dainty Morocco case, ornamented and clasped in gilt. It had been trodden heavily underfoot, and thus escaped the hurried search of Mr. Rayburn. Mr. Rolls opened the case and drew a long breath of almost horrified astonishment, for there lay before him, in a cradle of green velvet, a diamond of prodigious magnitude and of the finest water. It was of the bigness of a duck's egg, beautifully shaped and without a flaw, and as the sun shone upon it, it gave forth a luster like that of electricity, and seemed to burn in his hand with a thousand internal fires. He knew little of precious stones, but the Raja's diamond was a wonder that explained itself. A village child, if he found it, would run screaming for the nearest cottage, and a savage would prostrate himself in adoration before so imposing a fetish. The beauty of the stone flattered the young clergyman's eyes. The thought of its incalculable value overpowered his intellect. He knew that what he held in his hand was worth more than many years' purchase of an archiepiscopal see, that it would build cathedrals more stately than Ely or Cologne, that he who possessed it was set free forever from the primal curse, 
and might follow his own inclinations without concern or hurry, without let or hindrance. And as he suddenly turned it, the rays leaped forth again with renewed brilliancy and seemed to pierce his very heart. Decisive actions are often taken in a moment and without any conscious deliverance from the rational parts of man. So it was now with Mr. Rolls. He glanced hurriedly round, beheld like Mr. Rayburn before him, nothing but the sunlit flower garden, the tall treetops, and the house with blinded windows. And in a trice he had shut the case, thrust it into his pocket, and was hastening to his study with the speed of guilt. The Reverend Simon Rolls had stolen the Raja's diamond. Early in the afternoon the police arrived with Harry Hartley. The nurseryman, who was beside himself with terror, readily discovered his hoard, and the jewels were identified and inventoried in the presence of the secretary. As for Mr. Rolls, he showed himself in a most obliging temper, communicated what he knew with freedom, and professed regret that he could do no more to help the officers in their duty. Still, he added, I suppose your business is nearly at an end. By no means replied the man from Scotland Yard, and he narrated the second robbery of which Harry had been the immediate victim, and gave the young clergyman a description of the more important jewels that were still not found, dilating particularly on the Raja's diamond. It must be worth a fortune, observed Mr. Rolls. Ten fortunes, twenty fortunes, cried the officer. The more it is worth, remarked Simon shrewdly, the more difficult it must be to sell. Such a thing has a physiognomy not to be disguised and I should fancy a man might as easily negotiate St. Paul's Cathedral. Oh, truly, said the officer, but if the thief be a man of any intelligence, he will cut it into three or four, and there will be still enough to make him rich. Thank you, said the clergyman. You cannot imagine how much your conversation interests me. Whereupon the functionary admitted that they knew many strange things in his profession, and immediately after took his leave. Mr. Rolls regained his apartment. It seemed smaller and barer than usual. The materials for his great work had never presented so little interest, and he looked upon his library with the eye of scorn. He took down, volume by volume, several fathers of the church and glanced them through, but they contained nothing to his purpose. These old gentlemen, thought he, are no doubt very valuable writers, but they seem to me conspicuously ignorant of life. Here am I, with learning enough to be a bishop, and I positively do not know how to dispose of a stolen diamond. I glean a hint from a common policeman, and with all my folios, I cannot so much as put it into execution. This inspires me with very low ideas of university training. Herewith he kicked over his bookshelf, and putting on his hat, hastened from the house to the club of which he was a member. In such a place of mundane resort he hoped to find some man of good counsel and a shrewd experience in life. In the reading room he saw many of the country clergy and an archdeacon. There were three journalists and a writer upon the higher metaphysic playing pool. And at dinner, only the raff of ordinary club frequenters showed their commonplace and obliterated countenances. None of these, thought Mr. Rolls, would know more on dangerous topics than he knew himself. None of them were fit to give him guidance in his present strait. At length in the smoking room, up many weary stairs, he hit upon a gentleman of somewhat portly build and dressed with conspicuous plainness. He was smoking a cigar and reading the fortnightly review. His face was singularly free from all sign of preoccupation or fatigue, and there was something in his air which seemed to invite confidence and to expect submission. The more the young clergyman scrutinized his features, the more he was convinced that he had fallen on one capable of giving pertinent advice. Sir, said he, you will excuse my abruptness, but I judge you from your appearance to be pre-eminently a man of the world. I have indeed considerable claims to that distinction, replied the stranger, laying aside his magazine with a look of mingled amusement and surprise. I, sir, continued the curate, am a recluse, a student, a creature of ink bottles and patristic folios. A recent event has brought my folly vividly before my eyes, and I desire to instruct myself in life. By life, he added, I do not mean Thackeray's novels, but the crimes and secret possibilities of our society, and the principles of wise conduct among exceptional events. I am a patient reader. Can the thing be learnt in books? You put me in a difficulty, said the stranger. I confess I have no great notion of the use of books except to amuse a railway journey. 
Although I believe there are some very exact treatises on astronomy, the use of the globes, agriculture, and the art of making paper flowers. Upon the less apparent provinces of life, I fear you will find nothing truthful. Yet stay, he added. Have you read Gaborio? Mr. Rolls admitted he had never even heard the name. You may gather some notions from Gaborio, resumed the stranger. He is at least suggestive, and as he is an author much studied by Prince Bismarck, you will at the worst lose your time in good society. Sir, said the curate, I am infinitely obliged by your politeness. You have already more than repaid me, returned the other. How? inquired Simon. By the novelty of your request, replied the gentleman, and with a polite gesture as though to ask permission, he resumed the study of the fortnightly review. On his way home, Mr. Rolls purchased a work on precious stones and several of Gaboriau's novels. These last, he eagerly skimmed until an advanced hour in the morning. But although they introduced him to many new ideas, he could nowhere discover what to do with a stolen diamond. He was annoyed, moreover, to find the information scattered amongst romantic storytelling, instead of soberly set forth after the manner of a manual. And he concluded that, even if the writer had thought much upon these subjects, he was totally lacking in educational method. For the character and attainments of Lecoq, however, he was unable to contain his admiration. He was truly a great creature, ruminated Mr. Rolls. He knew the world as I know Paley's evidences. There was nothing that he could not carry to a termination with his own hand, and against the largest odds. Heavens, he broke out suddenly, is not this the lesson? Must I not learn to cut diamonds for myself? It seemed to him as if he had sailed at once out of his perplexities. He remembered that he knew a jeweller, one B. McCulloch, in Edinburgh, who would be glad to put him in the way of the necessary training. A few months, perhaps a few years, of sordid toil, and he would be sufficiently expert to divide and sufficiently cunning to dispose with advantage of the Raja's diamond. That done, he might return to pursue his researches at leisure, a wealthy and luxurious student, envied and respected by all. Golden visions attended him through his slumber, and he awoke refreshed and light-hearted with the morning sun. Mr. Rayburn's house was on that day to be closed by the police, and this afforded a pretext for his departure. He cheerfully prepared his baggage, transported it to King's Cross, where he left it in the cloakroom, and returned to the club to while away the afternoon and dine. If you dine here today, Rolls, observed an acquaintance, you may see two of the most remarkable men in England, Prince Florizel of Bohemia and old Jack Vandeleur. I have heard of the prince, replied Mr. Rolls, and General Vandeleur I have even met in society. General Vandeleur is an ass, returned the other. This is his brother John, the biggest adventurer, the best judge of precious stones, and one of the most acute diplomatists in Europe. Have you never heard of his duel with the Duke de Valdorge? Of his exploits and atrocities when he was dictator of Paraguay? of his dexterity in recovering Sir Samuel Levy's jewellery, nor of his services in the Indian mutiny, services by which the government profited, but which the government dared not recognise. You make me wonder what we mean by fame, or even by infamy, for Jack Vandeleur has prodigious claims to both. Run downstairs, he continued, take a table near them and keep your ears open. You will hear some strange talk, or I am much misled. But how shall I know them? inquired the clergyman. Know them? cried his friend. Why, the prince is the finest gentleman in Europe, the only living creature who looks like a king. And as for Jack Vandeleur, if you can imagine Ulysses at seventy years of age and with a sabre cut across his face, you have the man before you. Know them indeed. Why, you could pick either of them out of a derby day. Rolls eagerly hurried to the dining room. It was as his friend had asserted. It was impossible to mistake the pair in question. Old John Vandeleur was of a remarkable force of body, and obviously broken to the most difficult exercises. He had neither the carriage of a swordsman, nor of a sailor, nor yet of one much inured to the saddle. But something made up of all these, and the result and expression of many different habits and dexterities. His features were bold and aquiline, his expression arrogant and predatory, his whole appearance that of a swift, violent, unscrupulous man of action and his copious white hair and the deep sabre cut that traversed his nose and temple added a note of savagery to a head already remarkable and menacing in itself. In his companion, the Prince of Bohemia, 
Mr. Rolls was astonished to recognize the gentleman who had recommended him the study of Gaboriau. Doubtless Prince Florizel, who rarely visited the club, of which, as of most others, he was an honorary member, had been waiting for John Vandeleur when Simon accosted him on the previous evening. The other diners had modestly retired into the angles of the room and left the distinguished pair in a certain isolation. But the young clergyman was unrestrained by any sentiment of awe, and marching boldly up, took his place at the nearest table. The conversation was indeed new to the student's ears. The ex-dictator of Paraguay stated many extraordinary experiences in different quarters of the world, and the prince supplied a commentary which, to a man of thought, was even more interesting than the events themselves. Two forms of experience were thus brought together and laid before the young clergyman, and he did not know which to admire the most, the desperate actor or the skilled expert in life, the man who spoke boldly of his own deeds and perils, or the man who seemed like a god to know all things and to have suffered nothing. The manner of each aptly fitted with his part in the discourse. The dictator indulged in brutalities alike of speech and gesture. His hand opened and shut and fell roughly on the table, and his voice was loud and heavy. The prince, on the other hand, seemed the very type of urbane docility and quiet. The least movement, the least inflection, had with him a weightier significance than all the shouts and pantomime of his companion. And if ever, as must frequently have been the case, he described some experience personal to himself, it was so aptly dissimulated as to pass unnoticed with the rest. At length the talk wandered on to the late robberies and the Raja's diamond. That diamond would be better in the sea, observed Prince Florizel. As a vandaleur, replied the dictator, your highness may imagine my descent. I speak on grounds of public policy, pursued the prince. Jewels so valuable should be reserved for the collection of a prince or the treasury of a great nation. To hand them about among the common sort of men is to set a price on virtue's head. And if the Raja of Kashgar, a prince, I understand, of great enlightenment, desired vengeance upon the men of Europe, he could hardly have gone more efficaciously about his purpose than by sending us this apple of discord. There is no honesty too robust for such a trial. I myself, who have many duties and many privileges of my own, I myself, Mr. Vandeleur, could scarce handle the intoxicating crystal and be safe. As for you, who are a diamond hunter by taste and profession, I do not believe there is a crime in the calendar you would not perpetrate. I do not believe you have a friend in the world whom you would not eagerly betray. I do not know if you have a family. But if you have, I declare you would sacrifice your children. And all this for what? Not to be richer, nor to have more comforts or more respect, but simply to call this diamond yours for a year or two until you die, and now and again to open a safe and look at it as one looks at a picture. It is true, replied Vandeleur. I have hunted most things, from men and women down to mosquitoes. I have dived for coral. I have followed both whales and tigers, and a diamond is the tallest quarry of the lot. It has beauty and worth. It alone can properly reward the ardours of the chase. At this moment, as your highness may fancy, I am upon the trail. I have a sure knack, a wide experience. I know every stone of price in my brother's collection as a shepherd knows his sheep and I wish I may die if I do not recover them every one. Sir Thomas Vandeleur will have great cause to thank you, said the prince. I am not so sure, returned the dictator with a laugh. One of the Vandeleurs will, Thomas or John, Peter or Paul, we are all apostles. I did not catch your observation, said the prince with some disgust, and at the same moment the waiter informed Mr. Vandeleur that his cab was at the door. Mr. Rolls glanced at the clock and saw that he also must be moving. And the coincidence struck him sharply and unpleasantly, for he desired to see no more of the diamond hunter. Much study having somewhat shaken the young man's nerves, he was in the habit of travelling in the most luxurious manner, and for the present journey he had taken a sofa in the sleeping carriage. You will be very comfortable, said the guard. There is no one in your compartment, and only one old gentleman in the other end. It was close upon the hour, and the tickets were being examined, when Mr. Rolls beheld this other fellow passenger ushered by several porters into his place. Certainly, there was not another man in the world whom he would not have preferred, for it was old John Vandeleur, the ex-dictator. The sleeping carriages on the Great Northern Line were divided into three compartments, one at each end for travellers, 
and one in the center fitted with the conveniences of a lavatory. A door running in grooves separated each of the others from the lavatory. But as there were neither bolts nor locks, the whole suite was practically common ground. When Mr. Rolls had studied his position, he perceived himself without defense. If the dictator chose to pay him a visit in the course of the night, he could do no less than receive it. He had no means of fortification, and lay open to attack as if he had been lying in the fields. This situation caused him some agony of mind. He recalled with alarm the boastful statements of his fellow traveller across the dining table, and the professions of immorality which he had heard him offering to the disgusted prince. Some persons, he remembered to have read, are endowed with a singular quickness of perception for the neighbourhood of precious metals. Through walls, and even at considerable distances, they are said to divine the presence of gold. Might it not be the same with diamonds? he wondered. And if so, who was more likely to enjoy this transcendental sense than the person who gloried in the appellation of the diamond hunter? From such a man he recognised that he had everything to fear, and longed eagerly for the arrival of the day. In the meantime he neglected no precaution, concealed his diamond in the most internal pocket of a system of great coats, and devoutly recommended himself to the care of Providence. The train pursued its usual even and rapid course, and nearly half the journey had been accomplished before slumber began to triumph over uneasiness in the breast of Mr. Rolls. For some time he resisted its influence, but it grew upon him more and more, and a little before York he was fain to stretch himself upon one of the couches and suffer his eyes to close, and almost at the same instant consciousness deserted the young clergyman. His last thought was of his terrifying neighbour. When he awoke it was still pitch dark, except for the flicker of the veiled lamp, and the continual roaring and oscillation testified to the unrelaxed velocity of the train. He sat upright in a panic, for he had been tormented by the most uneasy dreams. It was some seconds before he recovered his self-command, and even after he had resumed a recumbent attitude, sleep continued to flee him, and he lay awake with his brain in a state of violent agitation, and his eyes fixed upon the lavatory door. He pulled his clerical felt hat over his brow still farther to shield him from the light, and he adopted the usual expedients, such as counting a thousand or banishing thought, by which experienced invalids are accustomed to woo the approach of sleep. In the case of Mr. Rolls, they proved one and all vain. He was harassed by a dozen different anxieties. The old man in the other end of the carriage haunted him in the most alarming shapes, and in whatever attitude he chose to lie, the diamond in his pocket occasioned him a sensible physical distress. It burned, it was too large, it bruised his ribs, and there were infinitesimal fractions of a second in which he had half a mind to throw it from the window. While he was thus lying, a strange incident took place. The sliding door into the lavatory stirred a little, and then a little more, and was finally drawn back for the space of about twenty inches. The lamp in the lavatory was unshaded, and in the lighted aperture thus disclosed, Mr. Rolls could see the head of Mr. Vandeleur in an attitude of deep attention. He was conscious that the gaze of the dictator rested intently on his own face, and the instinct of self-preservation moved him to hold his breath, to refrain from the least movement, and keeping his eyes lowered to watch his visitor from underneath the lashes. After about a moment, the head was withdrawn and the door of the lavatory replaced. The dictator had not come to attack, but to observe. His action was not that of a man threatening another, but that of a man who was himself threatened. If Mr. Rolls was afraid of him, it appeared that he, in his turn, was not quite easy on the score of Mr. Rolls. He had come, it would seem, to make sure that his only fellow traveller was asleep and when satisfied on that point, he had at once withdrawn. The clergyman leapt to his feet. The extreme of terror had given place to a reaction of foolhardy daring. He reflected that the rattle of the flying train concealed all other sounds, and determined, come what might, to return the visit he had just received. Divesting himself of his cloak, which might have interfered with the freedom of his action, he entered the lavatory and paused to listen. As he had expected, there was nothing to be heard above the roar of the train's progress, and laying his hand on the door at the farther side, he proceeded cautiously to draw it back for about six inches. Then he stopped, and could not contain an ejaculation of surprise. John Vandeleur wore a fur travelling cap with lappets to protect his ears, 
and this may have combined with the sound of the express to keep him in ignorance of what was going forward. It is certain, at least, that he did not raise his head, but continued without interruption to pursue his strange employment. Between his feet stood an open hat box. In one hand he held the sleeve of his sealskin great coat, in the other a formidable knife with which he had just slit up the lining of the sleeve. Mr. Rolls had read of persons carrying money in a belt, and as he had no acquaintance with any but cricket belts, he had never been able rightly to conceive how this was managed. But here was a stranger thing before his eyes, for John Vandeleur, it appeared, carried diamonds in the lining of his sleeve, and even as the young clergyman gazed, he could see one glittering, brilliant drop after another into the hat box. He stood riveted to the spot, following this unusual business with his eyes. The diamonds were, for the most part, small, and not easily distinguishable either in shape or fire. Suddenly the dictator appeared to find a difficulty. He employed both hands and stooped over his task, but it was not until after considerable manoeuvring that he extricated a large tiara of diamonds from the lining and held it up for some seconds' examination before he placed it with the others in the hat box. The tiara was a ray of light to Mr. Rolls. He immediately recognized it for a part of the treasure stolen from Harry Hartley by the loiterer. There was no room for mistake. It was exactly as the detective had described it. There were the ruby stars with a great emerald in the center. There were the interlacing crescents, and there were the pear-shaped pendants, each a single stone, which gave a special value to Lady Vandeleur's tiara. Mr. Rolls was hugely relieved. The dictator was as deeply in the affair as he was, neither could tell tales upon the other. In the first glow of happiness, the clergyman suffered a deep sigh to escape him, and as his bosom had become choked and his throat dry during his previous suspense, the sigh was followed by a cough. Mr. Vandeleur looked up, his face contracted with the blackest and most deadly passion, his eyes opened widely, and his underjaw dropped in an astonishment that was upon the brink of fury. By an instinctive movement, he had covered the hat box with the coat. For half a minute the two men stared upon each other in silence. It was not a long interval, but it sufficed for Mr. Rolls. He was one of those who think swiftly on dangerous occasions. He decided on a course of action of a singularly daring nature, and although he felt he was setting his life upon the hazard, he was the first to break silence. I beg your pardon, said he. The dictator shivered slightly, and when he spoke his voice was hoarse. What do you want here? he asked. I take a particular interest in diamonds, replied Mr. Rolls, with an air of perfect self-possession. Two connoisseurs should be acquainted. I have here a trifle of my own which may perhaps serve for an introduction. And so saying, he quietly took the case from his pocket, showed the Raja's diamond to the dictator for an instant, and replaced it in security. It was once your brother's, he added. John Vandeleur continued to regard him with a look of almost painful amazement, but he neither spoke nor moved. I was pleased to observe, resumed the young man, that we have gems from the same collection. The dictator's surprise overpowered him. I beg your pardon, he said. I begin to perceive that I am growing old. I am positively not prepared for little incidents like this, but set my mind at rest upon one point. Do my eyes deceive me, or are you indeed a parson? I am in holy orders, answered Mr. Rolls. Well, cried the other, as long as I live I will never hear another word against the cloth. You flatter me, said Mr. Rolls. Pardon me, replied Vandeleur. Pardon me, young man. You are no coward but it still remains to be seen whether you are not the worst of fools. Perhaps, he continued, leaning back upon his seat, perhaps you would oblige me with a few particulars. I must suppose you had some object in the stupefying impudence of your proceedings, and I confess I have a curiosity to know it. It is very simple, replied the clergyman. It proceeds from my great inexperience of life. I shall be glad to be persuaded, answered Vandeleur whereupon Mr. Rolls told him the whole story of his connection with the Raja's diamond, from the time he found it in Rayburn's garden to the time when he left London in the Flying Scotchman. He added a brief sketch of his feelings and thoughts during the journey, and concluded in these words. When I recognized the tiara I knew we were in the same attitude towards society, and this inspired me with a hope, which I trust you will say was not ill-founded that you might become in some sense my partner in the difficulties and, of course, the profits of my situation. To one of your special knowledge and obviously great experience, 
The negotiation of the diamond would give but little trouble, while to me it was a matter of impossibility. On the other part, I judged that I might lose nearly as much by cutting the diamond, and that not improbably with an unskillful hand, as might enable me to pay you with proper generosity for your assistance. The subject was a delicate one to broach, and perhaps I fell short in delicacy. But I must ask you to remember that for me the situation was a new one, and I was entirely unacquainted with the etiquette in use. I believe without vanity that I could have married or baptized you in a very acceptable manner. But every man has his own aptitudes, and this sort of bargain was not among the list of my accomplishments. I do not wish to flatter you, replied Vandeleur, but upon my word, you have an unusual disposition for a life of crime. You have more accomplishments than you imagine, and though I have encountered a number of rogues in different quarters of the world, I never met with one so unblushing as yourself. Cheer up, Mr. Rolls. You are in the right profession at last. As for helping you, you may command me as you will. I have only a day's business in Edinburgh on a little matter for my brother. And once that is concluded, I return to Paris, where I usually reside. If you please, you may accompany me thither. And before the end of a month, I believe I shall have brought your little business to a satisfactory conclusion. At this point, contrary to all the canons of his art, our Arabian author breaks off the story of the young man in holy orders. I regret and condemn such practices, but I must follow my original and refer the reader for the conclusion of Mr. Roll's adventures to the next number of the cycle, The Story of the House with the Green Blinds. Thank you for listening. If you like our recordings, consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks.